Awesome. Um, thank you, guys. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I'm sorry for the kind of BuzzFeedy title. Um, there's some good content, though, so don't worry. Um, again, kind of like Sarah mentioned, I'm Greg. Um, I help out with the OAuth San Antonio chapter. So if you're working on something new and cool and would like to demo it there, we'd love to have you. Um, yes, I, I tricked the, the DEF CON folks into letting me speak once. Um, I've tricked the last CON folks into letting me speak twice. Um, I got my first legal threat in research this year, so that was pretty flattering. Um, I think that means I'm moving up, but who knows. Um, I, I firmly believe that if you're going to talk at a security conference, you better have a proof of concept to back up what you're talking about, um, which I know is what everyone wants to get to, right? We all want the, the final product or the, the sausage, but um, we're not going to get straight to the sausage. We are first going to take a tour of the sausage making facility um, because I think that the process is just important as the final product in, um, in this presentation. Cool. Um, on to the good stuff. A little background to, to kind of set the scene is I've worked in cloud for almost three years now um, in addition to founding a startup. And um, when I first got to cloud, I still thought I was kind of the, the traditional security guy. Um, I believed that we were all very, very special snowflakes and that automation was good, but um, nothing would ever be able to um, replace us as testers or make the manual process more efficient. Um, I spent a year managing and leading a team that was focused on functional automation, which kind of really opened my eyes. Um, and the fundamental thing that I took away from it is that security is really behind the ball in comparison to the rest of the industry, um, in comparison to our dev counterparts, in comparison to our functional testing counterparts, and just in comparison to the industry as a whole. Um, and right now, I don't know a whole lot of dev teams that are really satisfied with their security teams because uh, the, the unfortunate reality that I've kind of come to see is that we're the guys that are usually holding things up on releases. Um, you know, maybe it takes you two weeks to do a, a manual security assessment, but it takes the functional guys one day to, one day to run their tests. Um, I've also never really met a team that has the, the perfect resources to test every aspect of every application, um, which I think is what like makes engineers the most valuable resource in our process and kind of the, the typical process for um, us as penetration testers is we first do an assessment, we generate a report that we then hand off to the dev team. Um, they might fix things, they might not, but eventually it's our job to retest and usually things aren't fixed. Um, so again, this, this process is um, extremely resource, um, it consumes a lot of resources, especially on the, the, the people side especially if you have to retest multiple, multiple times. Yeah, so again, retesting is expensive. So I'm kind of tired of seeing this slide, but I didn't know how else to say it. Um, I started to think about in this role how we could make security more efficient. And um, I've, I've been doing this process for a while now to automate the, the manual tests that we've created in a way to do it easily and efficiently. And um, after you kind of get good at it, I found that it only adds about like 25 to 30% additional overhead and time to get this created. Um, and so right now, if you're paying like $100,000 for like a commercial application testing tool, um, at least for me, it doesn't hit the final check mark. It doesn't give me enough to sleep at night and be confident that it found everything that it should. And so um, if you undertake this process, I think overall, I don't know what you're paying your engineers, but um, I think overall it'll probably save you some time and money and give you an extra value add that I don't think you can get from commercial products. So kind of the process improvement that I suggest is rather than just creating a report, you take some time to create an automated script. And um, I'll get into the best ways to do that in a little bit. But um, you can then take this script and either hand it off to your dev team or hand it off to a resource that's less valuable to uh, rerun and retest products. And we can even take that one step further and use continuous delivery tools to completely remove the, the human aspect from retesting. And um, the framework that I like to use for this is Selenium. If you're not familiar with Selenium, it is a testing tool primarily used by functional testers to uh, mimic and mock a user's behavior in a web browser. Um, what I really like about Selenium is it gives us uh, superior XSS validation 
because you can more natively detect when it's occurring. You're not using a proxy with Burp Suite or anything like that. You can actually switch the alert, validate that it's your message, and uh, keep testing. It also has a, a very low time to get started with. Um, there, there's something called the Selenium IDE, which I'll get to, which lets you export uh, Python or code of your choice to give you kind of a, a starting point for um, creating security automation. The other really big plus to Selenium is it's semi-fault tolerant, meaning that um, most of these tests you could reproduce just by using a request library. Um, but let's say you have like some endpoint that you're posting data to, and the developer changes that endpoint. So either the, the URL changes or the actual data changes. Um, hopefully, the developer is hooking up that post request to somewhere in the UI, and they've hooked it up correctly. So as long as like the HTML and the CSS doesn't significantly change, uh, most Selenium tests won't actually break. So again, that, that's less work for your security team overall and um, the investment your department is making. Um, the, the one kind of downside to Selenium is it's not very efficient compared to a request library because it is, again, um, running in a browser, but that can kind of be uh, mitigated with the continuous deployment tools because you can run everything in parallel. Um, so to show you just exactly what I'm talking about with Selenium, for those who have never seen it, I have uh, the budget store running over here. It's a, a purposely vulnerable web application that I chose um, just for the demo. And um, Selenium is just like a one-click install in Firefox to get the ID, so I'm not gonna show you how to install it. But all I do is I come over here to my little Selenium button. You can see uh, the red button is on, which means it's recording my actions. So I start by um, clicking on the search button. Um, what I think about right here is, of course, like injection and fuzzing. So I just type inject me, I click submit, and you can see that uh, Selenium is following me around. So it saw that I opened the, the page, I clicked the link, I sent inject me as the payload, and then it clicks submit for me. Or it's reproducing me clicking submit. Uh, the other page that I was particularly interested in was login. So Again, I go to log in, type inject me, type inject me. Oops. And all that gets recorded in Selenium. So then uh, I go to source, and we can see uh, it's HTML, which isn't really helpful. And I go to format, and I change that to Python 2 with WebDriver, and it's an experimental, an experimental feature. So um, there's a warning, but whatever. And um, this will give you code that will literally mimic the actions that I just made in Python. Um, and I've got a better view. It's a little hard to see right here. But um, going back to the slides, this is the, the final um, code that using the IDE gives you. I've just added two comments to show you what I'm going to use for cross-site scripting and what I'm going to use for SQL injection. And then um, just to run like the initial script. It's going to go fast, but it's just copying all the, uh, the actions that I already took and just run it again. No, you cannot run Selenium headless. Or maybe you can, but there you go. Yeah, you can use PhantomJS, but I'm not that cool, so that's not what I'm doing. Um, but anyways, yeah, so we can see that it literally just mimics all the behavior that we've done in the browser. And so again, um, I'm going to use this part at the top for cross-site scripting, this part at the bottom for uh, SQL injection, which is all what the IDE has already generated for us. So um, this is my test for cross-site scripting. Again, you can see in blue what I've copied over. All that I'm doing is um, I'm reading from a list of cross-site scripting string, strings, and then I'm checking to see if an alert box was triggered. If it was triggered, is it the message that I'm expecting? So I know that I'm actually triggering this alert box and it's not um, part of the, the regular functionality of the application. And then based on that, I'm sending some information to a pretty parser, which is going to make some real pretty output for whoever has to look at it. This is the code that I'm using for SQL injection. Um, for SQL map, you, I either use dash U for URL or dash R for post requests. It's a, it's a really, 
um, handy functionality for SQL map that I'm not sure everyone's familiar with. Um, and so to, to get that, all I'm doing is I'm intercepting a request in burp. And all this code will be available, by the way. So like, don't feel like you have to snap pictures or, or scribble furiously. Um, but anyway, so I, I uh, take this request that I've intercepted from burp, and I copy it uh, to this text file. And then I rely on SQL map to figure out how to parse that and um, attack the username and password variables. And so SQL map is one of the few like automated tools that I really trust. So on the left gets you to a, a completely automated solution. But if you wanted to take it one step further, so the person that you're handing off your script to can actually see the, um, the injection occur, I've come up with some code on the right for that as well. And again, it mostly borrows from the original code that we took from Selenium IDE, which is noted in blue. But so the final product of all this is this script that I've called, that made called lastcon.py. And again, it's exactly what we just looked, like, looked at. Again, pretty printer. But it's going to go to the website. It's going to start throwing um, XSS strings at it. You'll see that these strings are passing, meaning that uh, the website wasn't vulnerable, fails on one, passes on the next one, and then it takes the, uh, the post request, uh, throws it to SQL map, and then tests it. And then you can see it actually logs in as the user using the, the payload handed to it from SQL map. But, so this is great. Um, I think for us, because again, you can hand it off to the dev team, you can hand it off to a less valuable resource, but um, you can also use continuous deployment to remove the, the human element whatsoever. Uh, also, a lot of dev folks are using continuous development, so you can get to this really great place where your devs are pushing code and you don't have to look at it, and like you can push code and Jenkins already automatically knows to um, run your new tests against their new code. Do we, do we have folks here who are using Jenkins like in their current builds and deploys? Yes, awesome. That's the, the best number I've seen so far, which is exciting. Um, if you're not familiar with Jenkins, it's a uh, continuous deployment tool that's used to both, no, that's a bad picture, I'm sorry, um, that is used to both test and release new software. So it has a, uh, a testing phase that's usually done here. This can be your functional tests but now it can also be your security tests. And then it has a, a release phase where it will deploy your code should it pass every test to, let's say, a pre-production environment for you. And then um, it'll run the tests again. And then if all that goes well, it'll finally kick the code to your production server. So it's extremely efficient. It's, um, it's really what's taking over cloud. is the pipeline part of Jenkins. So there, there's a lot of different ways to build pipelines in Jenkins. By default, you don't really need a plugin. Um, but so if you haven't seen Jenkins before, this is again the, the typical view. You'll see your, your types of jobs at the top, um, the names of the jobs. On the left, you'll see the, the status of the last job run. So blue or green means passing, red is failing. And um, Jenkins also provides a, a history of the jobs. So. Again, we want to take this one step further to completely remove the human element, free up our security engineers to do the, the testing that really matters. Um, I don't know about you guys, but I really don't like doing menial work. I don't like testing the same thing over and over again. Um, it gets old. It's not fun. So um, by doing this again on an individual product basis, you um, front load a little of your work, but I think you get a large value add out of it. But so how we actually port this into Jenkins is the original file that we saw was one single Python file that we were running all of our tests out of as methods. All you have to do is, is split them up. I like to split them up on, on, um, by test because, again, this gives you the opportunity to run things in parallel in Jenkins to um, help mitigate the fact that Selenium can take up to a minute to run a test. So all you have to add so Jenkins knows whether a test is, test is passing or failing is this uh, self-assert true and um, self-assert, yeah. So all you have to do is put in assert statements and then um, Jenkins knows whether to pass or fail a test. And again, um, 
to, to add granularity and, and make things run in parallel, I like to make a, a method for each single test. So in this example, we would have one for SQL injection and one for cross-site scripting. And so the awesome thing about this is you get kind of this, this, this code inception almost because we're using Jenkins to test to see if their code is ready to test, which can then uh, test to see if we have new tests for that software, and then we can use those tests to actually test their software. Um, but to show you what the, the final product looks like, I have a Jenkins server over here with everything running. That's kind of hard to see. Oops. Cool. So um, this is kind of the dashboard that I built. Um, I have an empty chest just so something's actually passing. Uh, again, an individual script for SQL injection, an individual script for cross-site scripting, um, and then the, the history of the jobs. And then Jenkins comes with a lot of great plugins to, to build off of. So you could have an email that goes out every time a test is finished. And if it fails, one of your engineers could get alerted and actually go look at it. Um, there's also a great deal of statistics that come with Jenkins by default. Um, my graph is not very pretty because I didn't give it very much data. But um, this view might be a little bit more interesting to you. It shows um, the successes, the failures, and gives you kind of an idea of how stable your product might or might not be from both a, a security perspective, but also just a, a general um, functional perspective. But again, like test inception, right? Pretty cool. Um, again, frees up your engineers to do what is the most important and also gives you a huge value add that I don't think folks are getting out of other products. But um, if, you're, if anyone's out there and they're thinking, man, Greg, this is a whole lot of work and I don't really feel like doing it, I feel you because I don't really like to do work either. But um, at, at Infinitive, which is the startup that I work at, this is all we do day in and day out is build um, security automation and pipelines for our clients. But um, as promised, here's the, the GitHub link with all the starter code. You should immediately be able to go um, pull it down and run the last con file. The, the Jenkins um, scripts require you to just change the absolute path. But um, if you have any problems, which you shouldn't, but I don't know, things always go wrong in code, please feel free to reach out on Twitter or email me. Yep, if for some reason you don't want to use Jenkins, like if you already, if you always want to have the granularity to kick off tests, you can also use something called Selenium Grid, which is used by uh, functional folks to run things in a variety of different browsers all at once in parallel. Um, so it's, it's just another option that I didn't really talk about if um, you want to make sure you have your tests running in every single browser. Honestly, we usually end up rolling our own. Uh, again, like most of it can be done with, with like Python requests. Uh, if you want to like really get a big increase in efficiency, but then you're going to have to write um, a lot of your own rules around um, both like how you want to interact with the the web page or the API, um, as well as like validation and parsing. And um, Selenium does a great job of giving you like a phenomenal amount of methods to to work with. Um, so the reason that that at least for web applications that we that we like to stick with Selenium is. Um, Again, like very low barrier to entry to get things up and running. Um, but again, um, for like APIs and stuff, I don't know, Matt, Matt talked about Centrobos earlier, which is, which is a pretty phenomenal tool and open source. Cool. Thanks, guys. Take care.